Well, yeah, I, I can sing songs about chicks because my chick's right here beside me. So uh, I can sing all those love songs and everything. And, and uh, let me tell you a uh, little bit about, about our background, about my background first. Let's start there. You know, I tell people that I, was, um, I wasn't raised in, the, in, a, in a mobile home park. I was raised in the trailer hood, if you know what I mean. Uh, my dad actually went to prison when I was seven years old. And uh, at 12, I said, I'm never going to do drugs. I'm never going to drink. I'm never even going to smoke cigarettes because those things have ruined all the men in my family. You know, I, I come from uh, that kind of family of church-going women and hell-raising men. And I swore I wasn't going to live that kind of lifestyle. And I said all that at 12 years old. And then at 13 years old, I was doing all of the above. And from about 13 to 19, man, I just progressively got wide open. I got arrested a bunch of times. I was dealing enough pot to get mine free. I was tripping on acid. Thank God crack wasn't around because I'd have been puffing on that pipe. I never liked needles. But then, you know what, guys, you know, um, you know the, the, the Greek word for witchcraft in the Bible, when you see that word, is pharmakia. And it's where we get um, the, the word pharmacy. And so when we use drugs of any kind to alter our mind, we put ourselves under a spell. Because I was this guy that said, I'm never going to use LSD, for example, man. I heard what that stuff can really freak you out and everything. But once I had a few drinks and I smoked some weed, man, I was under a spell and I tripped. And then, oh, it's not so bad. I did more and more of it. And, and some of you know what I'm talking about, man. You put yourself under a spell and you wake up and go, I can't believe that I did that. And so anyway, progressively... I got worse and worse. I went from a student that made A's and B's, occasional C, but I was a pretty good student. Um, and I, I went to uh, getting kicked out of three different high schools um, and never really finished. Uh, eighth grade was the last grade that I had finished. And, uh, and then, you know, I, I, here's what I had going on for me, though, man. I was living in this beat-up little apartment, um, you know, it, very small, not much. It was definitely smaller than this shed, tiny little place. It was 90 bucks a month. It was in a really bad part of town. I had a girl that was living with me that I'd gone to school with. It was just as much a troublemaker, gotten all kind of uh, trouble and drugs and all that. Everybody partied at our new little $90 a month apartment. Um, but I don't know why God let me see um, at 19. You know, here I was just wide open. And I was having a blast, don't get me wrong. If you don't have fun at sin, you ain't doing it right, okay? But we all know what sin is. It's a trap. It's only fun for a season. The pleasures of this life are fun for a season, pleasing for a season. Then the trap closes down. And uh, God let me see the trap coming. I started to realize that, oh, you know what? I got a values problem. I got weed in my pocket. I got liquor on the on the. Uh, uh, counter. I got beer in the fridge, but my lights are getting turned off in this little $90 a month shack. I credit it to a praying mama and a praying granny. You know, I tell people that I had uh, a drug problem from the time that I was born. Uh, my mom drugged me to church on Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, revival time. You guys know what I'm talking about. So a whole lot of seeds were planted in me, and I saw the trap, and I knew the only way out was complete surrender to Jesus. And, uh, and on November 23rd, 1982, that's exactly what I did. A strung out little punk with a drug problem, been in trouble with the law. Thank God I hadn't been arrested as an adult yet. I'd done plenty to get arrested, but I hadn't got caught as an adult yet. And uh, I got on my knees on November 23rd, 1982, crying, drunk. Back then I had I had hair, you know, down to here and a cross earring. You know, I was, I was one of those guys. This was, this was my music of the day. Randy Rhodes, great guitar player. Don't get me wrong. But I couldn't separate the sex, drugs, and rock and roll. You know, rock and roll is great, but some of the things that come along with it, if you're not careful. Um, let, me get, let me go down another rabbit trail real quick. There's no such thing as Christian music. You guys know that, right? Music is either good or bad. It leads you in a constructive direction, a positive direction, or it influences you in a bad direction. And there's been some stuff that's come out of the church that really isn't all that theolo theologically correct, you know. And so only people can be Christians, not, not music or anything else. I know what we mean by that. But anyway, I'm getting sidetracked. So here I was, this partying little kid and these seeds that had been planted in me by not just my mom and my granny, but, you know, I was raised a, a spiritual schizophrenic is what I tell people. I say, you know, 
Um, my mom worked two jobs to keep me in this little Christian school, and it was Free Will Baptist, and I don't mean to pick on the Free Will Baptist. Uh, it just, just this particular uh, church school, it was like, if your hair was over your collar, you go going to hell. Susan, you're wearing pants, you're going to hell. Wearing makeup, you're going to hell. It was very, very legalistic. That was Monday through Friday. Then on Sundays, um, I went to a hyper-Pentecostal church. I'm all about Pentecost, but this was all that was missing was the snakes church. I still remember a lady running around uh, screaming in tongues around the whole church, and her wig flies off, and she just keeps right on going, you know. And so I had all these influences, and despite the legalism, of the Free Will Baptist Church School, they planted the Word of God in me. That's what stands forever. That's what gets inside of us and separates, you know, soul and spirit. And and uh, and and in the Pentecostal church, you know, sometimes a little hyper Pentecostal, but the Word was getting planted in me. And my mom would read scriptures to me. And so here I was, this little punk, at 19 years old, and uh, fell on my knees. And like, you know, I'm in, I'm in it. It's like complete surrender. I'm not going to be perfect. But I'm going I'm to start leaning in the right direction. And the girl that I was living with, she walked in. She knew nothing. I'm here. She'd been at work. She comes home, and I'm, I'm crying my eyes out. I'm reeking of alcohol. And she knew nothing about the gospel, really. And I said, you know what? Here's what we need to do. And she got on her knees beside me, and she prayed with me because she loved me, you know. And then I said, you know, the next thing we need to do is we need to find a church that can tolerate us, you know, one with long hair and loud music. And so I still remember this church that I'd been taken to as a, as a child called uh, Rock Church. And maybe you've heard of John and Ann Jimenez. It was a church I remember at six years old going into this church. And there were hippies there. This is in the late 60s. There were hippies there. There were barefoot people there. The music, they had drums. They had rock and music. I said, let's go to that church. So we go to the church. And uh, I made up my mind, hey, if getting around the wrong people got me into the wrong stuff. Maybe if I get around people that are going in a better direction, I'll go in a better direction. So it wasn't like somebody had to tell me you got to go to church to be a Christian. I wanted to get around people that have to love me whether they like me or not because Jesus said so. And I wanted to get around people that maybe could show me how to do life a little better. And uh, so me and this girl, we start going to church. And then that was like, I told her, I said, you know, the Bible talks about you know, if we're living together and we're not married, that's, that, I think the Bible calls that fornication. And uh, long story short, 30 days uh, after I'd prayed that prayer and, and uh, she'd walked in and prayed that prayer with me, we got married on December 17th, 1982. And uh, this December, my lovely wife and I will be married 38 years. Come on, give, give God a hand for that. That's amazing. I'm not boasting in myself because I'm just as messed up as you. I struggle in all kinds of areas like you. I don't do the things I want to do. I do things I know I shouldn't do. But, you know, the Apostle Paul was in the same boat in Romans, I think it's 7, at the end of Romans 7, where he talks about what a wretched man I am. Here's the greatest missionary of all time, other than Jesus, of course, who wrote two-thirds of the New Testament, who planted all the original churches in the Middle East. Um, And he writes... I can't get it right. He says, what a wretched man I am. But thanks be to God for Jesus who leads us triumphantly. We can't be saved by our own works and our own righteousness. We're never going to get it right. We're never going to be good enough. We have to keep coming back to Jesus and having a relationship with Jesus. So anyway, I kind of got into all that stuff a little early. Those are some of the things we try to share wherever we go. That was kind of a mandate I felt like the Lord gave us to share our testimony. But thing I want you to get out of this whole thing is that there was a whole lot of stuff had to happen for you to be watching this to just say, God hasn't forgotten you. He hasn't forsaken you. He's still moving on the hearts of people to bless you. Not just us. I know there's other ministries out there thinking about you guys and, and uh, your situation. And so, hey, we're going to do an original song off of Still Moving Targets. That's the album I mentioned earlier, um, the summer of, I don't know if it was 2014 or 15 or something like that. We wrote a series of songs, uh, and some of them came out about relationships, and we know that uh, many of you have had some difficulties in relationships. We all do. You know, we've been married almost 38 years. It hasn't been without struggle. Um, This song isn't autobiographical, by the way. Sometimes songs just come, and uh, we've been singing it everywhere we go. It's a song called Wait. On the counter 
next to my shaving cream There's a cheap hairbrush I never clean It's got strands of you and strands of me Tangled all up like we used to be In the closet next to my faded blue jeans There's that black tank top you bought in New Orleans When our love was young and wild and our spirits free Before the rose in you met the thorn in me Wait, come and get your things Maybe we can work it out Wait, we got too much wrong Keep staring at this 14 karat golden band And picturing the day you put it on my hand We drove away so happy in that limousine Every word I spoke that day I still mean Wait, come and get your is hard work, man. But I'm going to tell you guys, listen, some of you got locked up. You weren't actually uh, involved in the life of a local church. Look, I know churches. Churches are full of messed up people, man. And if I was still pastoring a church, I would invite you to sit on the front row, be my friend, and go to dinner. And there's plenty of guys out there that think like me. They're great pastors. And I want to encourage you that many of you are getting out of this place. Two decisions radically changed my life to give my life to Christ, and to get involved in a local church. I did not know how to be a good dad. I didn't know how to be a good husband. I needed to get around people that were a few steps ahead of me to mentor and help me. And also, I needed a platform where I could help other people. And nothing but life and blessing has flowed out of that.